In this lesson, I'll go over the basic workflow, that is, the work process when grading in DaVinci Resolve. I will assume that the video files whose colors we want to adjust are located on the disk in one or several folders. As we can see from the bottom navigation bar of the DaVinci application, the software's visual layout itself suggests a particular workflow. The program contains four main work windows, or panels. Media, for importing files. Edit, for processing and editing. Color, for grading and deliver, for final export. The primary function of the media panel is import, that is, the input of video files will be grading. Say, our files are located in two folders on the storage disk. Before working with them, they need to be imported, that is, moved into the so-called media pool in DaVinci Resolve. In order to correctly identify the files, we can use visual thumbnails and even change the image size as necessary. The video can also be played back dynamically by moving the mouse. If we'd rather go by the names instead of images, the contents of our library can be displayed as a file list where we can also see the individual video parameters such as length, resolution, frames per second and so on. There are 8 videos in my folder and I can import them into the media pool in several ways. The easiest one is clicking and dragging files using the mouse. If I wish to remove files from the media pool, again I select them and press the delete key. Another way is to call up the menu with the right click of your mouse. I select the files, click the right mouse button and select add to media pool from the menu. I can use the same way to remove the files. Adding files into the media pool doesn't mean that you are actually moving them onto the storage disk. DaVinci Resolve works in such a way that your original files are always kept intact. The software in fact creates a link between your files and its own library, which is the media pool. That means that the files you use should remain in the disk library until the entire project is completed. There is, of course, the option to link them after they are moved, but in this tutorial we'll not focus on that alternative. In the media pool itself, the shots can be categorized into so-called bins for easier orientation. In the media pool, let's create two bins, for example, and categorize them the same way they were saved on the disk. The whole procedure can also be done automatically. In the disk library, we select our two folders and, with a right click, open up the menu, where we select the command to add folders and subfolders with simultaneous creation of bins. In the bottom right section of the window, we can view the basic metadata of our files, as well as more detailed metadata. In the upper part of the window, there is a viewer we can use to monitor the video files in our media pool or files still located on the disk, that is those we haven't yet placed into the media pool. If our video file contains an audio track, the audio channels will be displayed in this window. Our video contains a single stereo track, but some cameras or video recorders are able to record up to 16 audio channels. When some of the video file parameters have to be adjusted, we can do so with the right click of the mouse. We then select clip attribute change from the pop-up menu. This video file was filmed in 30 frames per second. Here we can change it to 25 frames per second and thus make it play slower while also making it longer. This effect is often used in commercials or music videos when the goal is to achieve a slightly slower movement of actors or singers. 
we'll return to some of the other media panel functions in the following lessons. Next one is the edit panel and as its name clearly suggests in it we'll be dealing with editing and with timelines. Our source files are located in the media pool which appears as data source in the current edit panel. The option to edit directly within the application first appeared in the DaVinci Resolve 10 version and version 11 has further improved it. In this lesson we will talk a bit about the ways in which we can work through the timeline. At this point you may think to yourself, well, I don't need a timeline, I just want to grade a single shot. Whether you wish to grade an entire film or just one shot, you're always required to create a timeline so that you can work in the next panel labeled color. There are four basic ways to create a timeline. It can be created by simply placing all our video material onto the timeline without any editing. This option is appropriate when we're using DaVinci Resolve to grade a whole material imported directly from a camera. That is, if we wish to color correct all the material we've filmed and subsequently work with it in another program. Another way to create a timeline is by using decision lists we obtain or actually export from another editing program such as Adobe Premiere, Avid Media Composer, Final Cut Pro, etc. These lists can come either in the older but proven EDL format or, of course, in one of the newer formats such as XML and AAF. This way of creating a timeline is used when we've already edited our video in one of these programs and only wish to use DaVinci for color grading. Our next function is so-called scene cut detection. Let's say you have an edited video in a single video file, for example QuickTime or AVI, and are unable to obtain an edit list, that is, you have no information about the locations of cuts in the video. If you start grading such a video as a single file, your corrections will be uniformly applied to all shots used in the video. In order to be able to grade individual shots in DaVinci Resolve, you first need to cut the video into individual shots. You could do it manually, of course, but DaVinci Resolve offers the scene cut detection function, which recognizes cuts automatically. Based on image changes, the program can evaluate where cuts are located in your video. Finally, the last option is to create a timeline by cutting directly in DaVinci Resolve. As I have mentioned, the edit panel contains virtually all tools needed for modern editing, including retiming, that is slowing down and speeding up shots, as well as a number of tools and effects, such as transitions, titles, generators, and so on. In this lesson, we'll go over the first option, that is, creating a timeline from all shots at full length. A new timeline is created either by a command located at the top bar or by a right click. The timeline can be named right away or assigned its time code. The important part is not to create a blank timeline, since this command creates a timeline from all shots located in the media pool. If we're not going to use certain shots, these can be removed using the delete key. After creating our timeline, Let's get to grading, which means we'll be working in the color panel. The timeline is located in the center and it is displayed in a mode that's slightly different than in editing programs we're used to. This way of displaying is often called the storyboard, that is, each shot has its own window and what matters is the length of the shot. The shots are stored in the sequence identical to our timeline, 
while right above the storyboard we can see their length, or a kind of a classic timeline template. If we press play, our timeline is played back the same way as with any other software. But notice that corresponding shots are being highlighted on the storyboard. Clearly, the length of a shot is extremely important in any editing application. However, for our current grading purposes, orientation by scenes is more appropriate. Not only is this type of navigation faster, but it also helps us visually with deciding about which shot we want to grade, which one to compare, which one has not yet been graded, and so on. In this lesson, we'll go over the color panel only briefly, since we'll talk about grading in detail a little later. In the left part of the panel, we will be working with the gallery and various correction presets. We'll also be saving our own corrections here, so that they can be consequently applied to other shots, or so that we're able to compare multiple versions of our grading. The option to select the timeline with which we wish to work is located above the viewer. DaVinci Resolve enables the creation of multiple timelines, and this menu offers us their overview. Another important piece of information is the timeline playback speed, which can be found above the viewer window. The green indicator means that we're monitoring our project in real time, while the red means that we're unable to reach real speed, and if we want to display the project in real time, we'll have to work with cache or proxy files. The node display window is located on the right side of our layout. I'd say this is the heart of the entire system, since here by interconnecting nodes, we accomplish the desired color correction. In other words, we do grading. A clear node appears with each new shot. If we want to make only a simple correction, theoretically, a single node could suffice. Since the shot was made in the logarithmic mode, we load the appropriate LUT table. Make a few primary corrections. Add saturation, and if we like the outcome, we can proceed with the next shot. So when do we need several nodes? Even with simple corrections like these, we can decide to divide them into several nodes for easy navigation. The primary advantage is that we can tell the software the order in which our corrections should be made, that is, in our case, first the LUT, then primary corrections and subsequently color saturation. Another advantage is the option to temporarily or permanently turn one or more nodes on and off. This way we can see how the image looks without, say, the primary corrections, while keeping the LUT table and the saturation functions unchanged. Below each node, there are icons indicating the functions that are applied to it. Similarly to other windows, the node window can be enlarged or reduced in order to adjust to the number of nodes currently used. The node window contains yet another significant option. It is the setting that defines whether we'll be working on individual shots, or clips, or on the entire timeline. Let's imagine that our grading is complete. Now using the center mouse button, I will quickly copy the first grade into all the remaining shots, 
and also briefly adjust some of the scenes. Yet, as it turns out, the less saturated image would seem to work better. There are two options. We either click through each shot and adjust each saturation separately, or we can switch to the timeline mode and make the correction there. All corrections we make this way will be applied to all shots located on this particular timeline. Here the program did not offer a clear note, so let's create one ourselves and, for example, substantially lower the color saturation. As we can see, the correction has been applied to each one of our shots. The corrections will also be displayed in the individual images on our storyboard. At times, however, they take longer to update, so if we are bothered by this, we can update them manually. For easier orientation, a color indicator is displayed under the images we have already graded. This way we know right away which scenes have and which have not been graded. The final part of the workflow is the delivery panel, which serves for the export of graded material. As you recall, we have created our timeline from all available clips at their full length. So naturally, we also want to export them from the application as the same individual labeled files, but graded of course. The delivery panel displays the timeline as well primarily so that we're able to correctly designate clips we wish to export. There is no need to export all of them. At times you may want to export just one or two adjusted clips. Using this orange indicator, we are now able to check that all our clips have been selected. In this lesson, we'll focus on the basic tab, that is, the basic export settings will suffice here we select the export of individual clips. Next, we select the appropriate video format and resolution. The files are labeled automatically, based on their original names, but let's select a different folder for export and name it, for instance, grading, so that our original files are not overwritten. Next, we start our export. When the application finishes the export, we can check in the grading folder that everything has gone as planned. In this lesson, we have covered the basic workflow in DaVinci Resolve by focusing on the application's four main panels.